Welcome to Europe Let's Cooperate. This is Interreg Europe's Interregional Cooperation Forum. My name is Mia Eden and I am your host throughout this plenary session. This is our largest event ever. So welcome on board. We are here to launch Interreg Europe's first call for project proposals in 2021-2027 programming period. We've got a two-part agenda for this morning. We're going to start by looking at how Interreg Europe fits in the bigger picture of EU cohesion policy and we're going to hear from the European Commission, from our managing authority, from the Committee of the Regions and of course from our own director. Then we will continue from 11 to 12.30 and talk about what the first call is all about. In between, we're also going to share some inspiration for you. You're going to hear about the new European Bauhaus initiative. So the agenda is full. We are ready. Are you ready? We've got some polls running on Slido. We have a chat that has been going crazy since this morning. So do let us know where you're joining from. Give us some feedback in those polls. You'll find it all on the right hand side of your screen right next to this video. If you don't see the polls, if you don't have access to the chat, you can also go straight to Slido and access the polls there with the hashtag Europe Cooperates. And that also works on social media, by the way, so do share your inputs there as well. I want to kick things off because we do have a lot of ground to cover, but first, some housekeeping. This event is part of the French EU presidency and as such we have French interpretation available for the plenary sessions. If you would rather listen to this session in French, please mute me here on the main stage and open an extra session on another tab. You'll find a session called French interpretation, open that audio file and you'll get a French stream instead. But keep this main stage open because this is where all the speakers are going to be this morning. We're going to stay here from now until 12.30, so stay along. Um, be active, participate, let's get going. We have a little welcome message from the Vice President of the Eau de France region here in France, in Lille, where we're based, our managing authority. So let's hear what he has to say. Mesdames et messieurs, bonjour. Permettez-moi tout d'abord de vous remercier d'avoir euh, répondu présent à cette journée euh, et permettez-moi également de remercier de saluer Madame Ferreira et Madame Maupertuis pour avoir également accepté d'introduire cet événement. La région Hauts-de-France, en tant qu'autorité de gestion du programme Interreg Europe pour la période qui s'ouvre, 21-27, est ravie de pouvoir officiellement lancer cette nouvelle et sixième génération du programme Interreg Europe. La région des Hauts-de-France, en tant qu'autorité nationale et représentante de la France dans les instances décisionnelles du programme, a aussi la responsabilité d'assurer, lors du premier semestre 2022, la présidence du programme. Or, nous le savons tous, c'est un moment, une période très riche et déterminante pour les prochaines années, car ce semestre consacrera la finalisation et l'adoption du programme, ainsi que le lancement du premier appel à projet. La période que nous venons de traverser, la période du Covid, constitue un frein majeur dans les échanges interrégionaux, avec des frontières renforcées, des interactions qui ont nécessairement été diminuées. Et cette période difficile ne doit pas nous empêcher de faire en sorte que le programme euh, nous permette, ce programme nous permette en fait d'être une opportunité pour développer, relancer les échanges, échanger notamment sur les bonnes pratiques entre les différentes régions, et puis d'évaluer l'impact réel et concret qui euh, est permis par ce programme dans nos territoires auprès de nos citoyens. Alors certains outils de notre programme permettent d'aller plus loin dans ces échanges de bonnes pratiques. C'est le cas notamment des plateformes thématiques qui sont autant d'opportunités de réfléchir à des problématiques communes qui se présentent à nos différentes régions européennes. On le voit bien, la contribution de ce programme est extrêmement concrète et euh, cette journée de lancement est une occasion très particulière et toutes trouvées pour renforcer nos connexions avec les différents acteurs européens qui partagent des centres d'intérêt communs et puis qui souhaitent aussi renforcer nos échanges. Cette première étape est donc absolument déterminante. Elle prouve aussi notre volonté de construire des partenariats et de développer des projets qui s'inscrivent dans ce premier appel ou naturellement ceux qui seront devant nous. Un mot pour conclure, tout simplement vous souhaitez de beaux échanges et faire en sorte que la coopération européenne soit renforcée. Et un mot, let's cooperate.
there you have it. Let's cooperate. This event is indeed about you and it's about how you can reach out to other regions and create new contacts. So make use of that opportunity. As I told you, this is the biggest Interreg Europe event ever. We had more than 4,000 people registered and you're making your way to the platform at a good pace. So keep coming in. Welcome if you're just joining us. Uh, do reach out to others. Let us know how things are going. Make use of the chat. Make use of the polls. Give us some inputs. Be active throughout the session because it is supposed to be a, a dialogue and a discussion. It is a special day. We are here to launch something new, a new call, a new program, new opportunities, new ideas, new projects. Um, I want to put these a little bit in the context because cooperation right now is probably more important than it has ever been. And we have a message from the European Commissioner on Cohesion and Reforms, Elisa Ferreira, who will tell you more. Dear Interreg Europe family, dear colleagues, I am delighted to participate in this key Interreg event. My thanks to the French Presidency for organizing it. Because more than ever before, we need cooperation in Europe. We live in dark days. Once in a century crises are becoming all too common. The financial crisis in 2008, from which some regions were and are still only just now recovering, COVID, of course, and recent Russian aggression in Ukraine. Whatever the challenges, less cooperation is not the answer. Indeed, cooperation at the European level is the first step in rising to all our challenges, including also the opportunities to digitalize the economy and to make Europe as we want, the world's first carbon neutral continent. So today matters. We have over 2000 participants drawn from across Europe because these interregional exchanges work. In the 2014 Interreg Europe program, 258 projects were supported, leading to more than 700 policy improvements and the changes in many regions. And I believe that the new program and the projects you discussed today will be even more effective. As you select and launch projects onto the waves of an uncertain future, I urge you to fix your compasses by three guiding stars. The first is that the key source of added value from Interreg Europe is helping regions stay tuned to policy developments and good practices. Do not underestimate your role here. Almost 90% of European regions participate and many of the long-term benefits come from the direct involvement of policymakers. So you act as a bridge between the different participants and between the programs and the European level. I urge you to use this role to discourage investments in past structures and sectors, which will be overtaken by events and encourage future future proof investments that are really fit for a green and digital economy, leaving no one and no region behind. I also urge you to encourage deep local roots because local development and the involvement of local people is a key to success in the new economy, as well as key to the future of our democracies. And I urge you to keep up to speed with all new policy developments and policy learning and communicate this. My second guiding star is the key role of administrative capacity building. I know. This is not always exciting work, but it is crucial work. We need greater administrative capacity because the challenges are greater too, because cohesion programs must speed up and because administrations must master a new digital world and be fit for e-government. So I urge you to use all the tools at your disposal to build administrative capacity through shared experiences and sharing policy learning. 
And my third guiding star is that we must demonstrate concrete results. You know what the critics say. So we must all do everything we can to create concrete results and demonstrate them to the world. Interreg Europe has led the way with concrete results in many fields. Telemedicine solutions in healthcare, support to small and medium companies, innovation, the digital economy in rural communities, electric mobility solutions to reduce carbon footprint, promoting cultural heritage with digital technology and waste management improvement. So I urge you to continue to focus on concrete, practical solutions. So there is much to discuss today. I urge you, I urge all participants to actively contribute in the first call for projects. And I urge you in every project to use the three guiding stars. First, stay tuned to the latest European policy developments and to the best policy practices. Second, build administrative capacity because the future requires administrations which are more competent and more digital. And third, Demonstrate concrete results, be practical, and silence the critics. Today, we have gathered from across Europe over 2,000 policy brains. You built on 20 years of the tradition of Interreg Europe. So I know you will find solutions, and we count on you. Thank you very much. I also know that you will find solutions and I'm happy to have so many of you live here with us today because today is the time to start talking about how we make it happen together. We've seen that cooperation works. I'm sure you've seen it as well, especially if you've already been involved in the cooperation project. So let's take a little moment here and, and talk about the EU priorities and what is coming and how Interreg Europe fits in all that. It is time to bring in a few more speakers, and this time they're going to join us live. Here with me in the studio is our director, Irvin Siveris, and we are also connected live to Brussels, to the European Commission and DG Regio, to Slavomir Tukarski, who is the director of... Uh, of DG Regio's department that is responsible for uh, European Territorial Cooperation, Interreg, and many other programs as well. So uh, welcome to you as well. Um, let's go into it. Interreg Europe and uh, interregional cooperation. Let's, let's start first maybe with the Commission's perspective on this one. Um, we know the EU priorities for 2021. We know the, the objectives of focusing on green and digital and transition and social and so forth. Um, so from your perspective, Mr. Tukarski, um, where do you think Interreg Europe could really make the biggest contribution here? Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to this event, which <clears throat> indeed marks the opening of the new era of cooperation for 2021-2027. You already heard from my commissioner, who probably expressed it much better than I can do. What is important for the commission, but let me add maybe a couple of words on, on this. So, indeed, we face major green and digital transitions, which eventually perhaps amount to the greatest ever social transition that our society will be going through in the years to come. And clearly, these changes have great potential for our citizens and for the convergence of our regions. Green transition might give new value to assets located in less developed regions. Green deal can create new sources of income for our citizens, new skills or new professional careers. The same holds true for digital transition. At the same time, however, these changes might also create new disparities, linked, for example, to energy poverty or digital exclusion. And these disparities, in turn, can feed popular discontent and put pressure on our democracies. In addition to this, we see also uh, an increasing impact of demographic challenges, leading to depopulation of whole towns and villages. And the long-term impact of the pandemic, which still leaves some marks on my voice, a current and going war in Ukraine, and probably new phenomena that we are not aware of yet, but that can either contribute or challenge the continent's cohesion. 
So internet Europe should be really on the forefront of European regions when meeting all these challenges, for good or for bad. Whatever the challenge, whatever the change, none of that can be fixed by any single country or region alone. So European regions and countries need to pull together their collective intelligence, to cooperate together, to find joint solutions to common problems, and to make the best for convergence for our regions and for our citizens. And this is where Interreg Europe makes a difference. Anticipate the changes, find pilot solutions, and make them available to all. This is why cooperation and sharing are the DNA of Interreg Europe. And this is why they make it the biggest platform for policymakers from EU regions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very inspiring. And it's true that we do have big challenges and it takes cooperation to solve those. So, Irvin, I would turn to you at this point and, and maybe ask you to comment on how you see Interreg Europe as contributing to this in the bigger picture. Yeah, thank you, Mia. And also welcome from my side. I'm happy to see so many participants uh, today for this uh, opening of the first call. Uh, what I want to say is um, Interreg Europe is a program which puts cohesion policy in practice. We um, allow, we even require that more and less advanced regions work together and learn from each other. We cover all territories of Europe, from the urban to the rural, from central to peripheral. And with the EU priority of the program working on capacity building, we allow the regions in Europe to work on all six topics of the cohesion policy. I think the program is there to help the regions to do exactly what Slavek Tukaski just uh, said used opportunities. Indeed, we do have a lot of opportunities and we also heard about some of those tools that are available through our program, some quite impressive results that we are, of course, happy to be building on. But maybe going back to the Commission on this one, um, do you perhaps some, have some expectations for Interreg Europe for the future program in terms of what, uh, how, how we should address these challenges? Well, certainly, uh, uh, interregional exchange of experience works, so, so I have very legitimate uh, uh, expectations that this will be so over the next years. And as I've been mentioned, now for the first time, uh, the program will engage on all policy areas of the cohesion policy. So my expectation would be to see really solid and inspiring projects on the twin transition and social cohesion, while at the same time paving the way for stronger involvement of our citizens and communities. And I emphasize the last point because the involvement of citizens is not only about bringing new and fresh ideas. And I think you also heard the commissioner saying something about that, about being local and, and, and about uh, local democracy. Um, so we need also the, uh, more engagement from our citizens uh, because it's not only about uh, uh, building uh, resilience at the local level, it's not only about uh, coming up with solutions uh, for local challenges, but it's also about uh, local democracy, which is so much under the challenge in the, in, the, in the recent years. We need more projects where citizens can deliberate about their future. We need more projects where citizens can come up with their own ideas and policy recommendations. It's, it's about Objective 5, but not only. <coughs> we need more local green deals where citizens can be the winners of green transition, which is much too often perceived only in terms of cost. I also hope that the program will ensure a good balance between less developed and more developed regions, as was the case in the past. And I would like to see more direct involvement of policymakers in the cooperation projects, so that we can see that our public intervention is more efficient and effective towards our objectives. I think we should also have legitimate expectations to see the results of interregional cooperation to be better integrated in the regional growth and job strategies. And finally, something what Commissioner also mentioned, uh, we expect Interreg Europe to play a key role in relaying the latest EU policy developments and initiatives to all the regional actors. And I think, just as it comes to my mind, the, the last two uh, uh, big challenges, big initiatives, which are so relevant right now, the migration, the impact of the, of the war in Ukraine, and, and also Repower EU, uh, the initiative that was triggered following the current energy crisis. 
Yes, very, very concrete uh, objectives there. And I think a good checklist, not only maybe for us as a program, but also for people planning projects. So I do hope our participants are taking note and will reflect this in the upcoming project proposals. Irvin, again, back to you. Uh, hearing all these expectations and, and the work that is kind of ahead of us, how are we going to deliver on this? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Slovak, uh, Slavik Tukaski, um, first of all, uh, the member states well listened already in advance the expectations of the uh, Commission and therefore they put all the expectations you just mentioned as a requirement for the project's applications in, meaning uh, the community involvement via the stakeholders group. We uh, require that more and less advanced regions work together, that they are together in one project. The policy makers have to be involved because we want to improve the policy so it doesn't work only with the policy makers. Um, and uh, we have a focus on the results. The objective of the program is improve policies. And this is closely monitored, especially when it comes to structural funds programs. Furthermore, we have the policy learning platform, which allows the regions, which offers the service uh, for the regions with a dedicated team of thematic experts to have a quick solutions, exchanges, policy improvements to achieve the objectives um, the Commission just mentioned. Yes, so the work is, is ahead of us and we will start working on it for sure. Um, very inspiring points from both of our speakers today, so I, I do hope that this resonates also with, with our, our, our participants today. We would actually be very keen to know how you feel about cooperation. What, what do you think about this? Does this sound doable, feasible? We will launch a new poll in Slido, so let us know what you think and maybe share a comment in the chat as well because the poll is going to be for one word only. We're putting together a little bit of a word cloud based on that. Um, we're getting towards the end of our little chat here, but I would maybe like to just ask both of you, starting with Slavomir Tukarski first, um, any final words or comments for our participants, thinking that we're now heading towards the launch of a new call and, and uh, start of something new. So. Uh, what kind of final words would you like to share with our participants or anyone interested in interregional cooperation? Well, indeed, today is the beginning of the first call. So we mark the, 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 the new era of cooperation. Uh, and uh, I would like to use this opportunity to encourage you to, to really actively participate in this call and take the opportunity to look for partners and, and for ideas. And I think this is really an opportunity which is unique to Interreg, where you're really free to work on, on new and, and fascinating concepts with whomever, whomever you want to. I, I really have a difficulty to find any other program that would give you this, this opportunity. And also, we should keep in mind that everybody can learn something new. Even those from the most developed regions can improve their policies by looking by the experience of the others. So as Interreg Europe, is a rich source of inspiration and policy learning available to all. I hope that you will find some inspiration during today's event that can you that later on you can take back to your regions. So this is something I would like to, to wish you and this is something I would like to end my intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone can learn something new. Um, Irvin, what about your final thoughts on this? Uh, what what would you like to share with our participants at this stage? Yeah, uh, what I want to share is, I mean, we saw that we see that many regions develop their policy, implement their policy in a very isolated way. On the other hand, we also see that the successful regions are the ones who are well connected, who learn from each other, know what the others are doing, and only then implement uh, their and change their policies. We therefore would, therefore would like to see, to implement inter-regional cooperation via this program as a kind of standard in policy development, policy changes. We would like that the regions, before they tackle a problem, look into the good examples we have in Europe, look into the rich treasure of experience, of brains, what Slavik just said, um, see what is going on, what works in the regions and also what didn't work in the regions in Europe and then improve the policies. And that is in, my, in a way uh, the wish we have and uh, as Slavek said already, use the opportunity the program offers. 
We have uh, later on further sessions. We explain you the details of the uh, project applications, what is necessary, the terms of reference. And I expect uh, many good applications so that the partner states, the program, can approve in December many good applications, uh, good projects, uh, policy learning, capacity building uh, for the European regions. Uh, thank you both so much. I think there's a lot of lot of valuable inspiration in those remarks that that people should be keeping in mind uh, as they start working for new projects and talking about new projects. We've said today is special. It's about launching something new. Irvin, what do you think? Is it time? Yes, I think we should slowly open the call. And maybe I give uh, the time and say three, two, one, the call is open. <laughs> so there we go. The call is open. You can start applying. You can start preparing your applications. You can find all the information on our website. And here we go. It's on. Um, with this, I think before we get into the call details, there might be a need to share a little bit more inspiration with our participants and see how this really, really works. We've heard from the Commission, we've heard from our managing authority, we've heard from our own director. Um, how does this work in the bigger scheme of things? What else is there? How can you start cooperating? We have one more speaker to bring in and we also have an extra keynote coming up right after this. So let's keep talking about cooperation, how it works, why you should do it. We are bringing in an additional speaker, this time from the Committee of the Regions, member of the Committee of the Regions and President of the Corsica Regional Assembly and the second Vice President of the Culture Commission in the European Committee of the Region, Marie Antoinette Montpertuis. Welcome. Um, a few extra remarks on how all this looks from the perspective of the Committee of the Regions. Um, a quick note for our viewers, this intervention will be in French, but we'll do a quick summary afterwards, so it will be translated. Don't feel lost. Um, stay with us, share your comments in the chat, let us know what cooperation means to you, and let's continue with you, Marie-Antoinette. Um, let's see how this works. So, from the perspective of the Committee of the Regions, um, how do you see the role of cohesion policy in this program period? Merci, merci pour votre question. Bonjour à tous. Uh, je me réjouis bien sûr d'avoir été convié à cet événement uh, de lancement d'Interreg Europe et je remercie tout particulièrement uh, Monsieur Leca uh, de la région Hauts-de-France uh, qui est autorité d'ailleurs de gestion du programme de m'avoir invité à cette, à cette journée de lancement. Alors, il s'agit d'un programme qui me tient particulièrement à cœur euh, parce que euh, il y a quelques mois, euh, j'avais rédigé au comité des régions un avis sur le nouveau règlement proposé par la Commission en matière de coopération territoriale européenne. Et j'étais euh, très favorable euh, au maintien de programmes tels qu'Interreg Europe. Nous avons beaucoup travaillé tous ensemble à l'échelle européenne et je ne peux que me féliciter que ce programme ait été intégré dans la programmation 2021-2027. Alors, je crois que la politique de cohésion euh, est l'une des politiques clés de l'Union européenne. Elle est fondamentale et elle dispose d'ailleurs d'une des enveloppes euh, les plus importantes euh, par rapport aux autres politiques de l'Union. Euh, mais cette politique de cohésion euh, ne peut tenir que si la coopération entre les régions, entre les villes, les porteurs de projets, les citoyens de l'Union, est bien consolidé. Euh, C'est le cas notamment avec les programmes Interreg, qui font désormais partie euh, de notre acquis européen, de notre patrimoine commun euh, en matière de coopération. Et c'est le cas, bien sûr, d'Interreg Europe. La coopération, euh, au cours des dernières années, n'a fait que s'intensifier. Euh, et elle continuera à le faire. Elle continuera à le faire parce que c'est un moteur, c'est un pilier de la politique de cohésion euh, et de l'Europe aussi, du territoire le plus petit, comme une île où je me situe aujourd'hui, euh, à celle d'un État tout entier. C'est 
je tiens à préciser aussi, en tant que membre du comité des régions et présidente d'une assemblée régionale, et cela ne va pas vous, vous surprendre, bien sûr, que les principes de partenariat et de gouvernance multiniveau sont des éléments clés de la politique de cohésion. Alors, il est essentiel, évidemment, euh, que les régions, les autorités locales, euh, les villes soient impliquées, que ce soit de l'élaboration des programmes, comme nous l'avons fait ces derniers mois, jusqu'à la mise en œuvre. Et j'en profite d'ailleurs pour saluer tout le travail qui a été réalisé par les différentes task forces euh, un travail efficace, un travail de qualité, euh, dans un contexte qui a été très difficile, parce que nous étions en période de pandémie. Et c'est leur travail et leur engagement qui nous permettent d'être là aujourd'hui pour cette journée de lancement. So, indeed, indeed, a very important moment, and I think Marie-Antoinette Maparty has a very a lot of experience to talk about cooperation because you were also the rapporteur of of the of the co cohesion policy and interreg um, papers in the Committee of the Regions, and and seeing that cooperation and cohesion cooperation is really vital to deliver on cohesion. It's the motor of cohesion, and we need to work together in the regions and and really bring our forces together to solve the challenges that we have and. And this, I think, is very much reflected also in the Interreg Europe's activities and the way and the way that the program works and the way that the projects work. Um, so maybe building on that and building on your experience, um, how do you how do you see really the benefits of interregional cooperation, maybe in your own region or from a broader perspective as a member of the Committee of the Regions? Alors, le premier bénéfice, uh, c'est la création conjointe de valeur ajoutée nous pouvons produire ensemble plus de choses que si nous travaillons chacun de notre côté. Et ça, c'est euh, essentiel et il faut toujours le répéter et le marteler. Nous pouvons faire des choses de manière séparée, mais lorsque nous travaillons ensemble, nous allons plus loin. Le deuxième, c'est euh, le partage exceptionnel d'expériences et de savoir-faire. Nous partageons, d'ailleurs, ça a été rappelé par Madame la Commissaire, des défis communs, malgré notre grande diversité. La diversité est une richesse en Europe. Euh, ces défis sont, vous le savez, la transition écologique et énergétique, le développement durable, la valorisation de nos patrimoines, l'évolution vers un avenir de partage à travers notamment l'économie sociale et solidaire, la paix sociale, bien sûr, la paix tout court en ces temps très troublés. Nous pouvons aussi certainement bénéficier des expériences d'autres autorités locales qui ont déjà mis en œuvre des projets identiques ou similaires. Nous pouvons bénéficier euh, des leçons qu'elles ont tirées, des bonnes pratiques qu'elles ont pu développer. Et il y a, je le rappelle, des idées dans toutes les collectivités locales. Et à partir du dialogue et du partage d'expériences, nous accroissons l'univers des possibles nous pouvons trouver des solutions communes à nos contraintes diverses. Aussi, euh, en associant diverses régions de différents pays de l'Union européenne à un même projet, et c'est la raison d'être d'Interreg Europe, c'est l'apprentissage par la diversité des méthodes, des points de vue, des échanges, et ça, évidemment, c'est une valeur ajoutée euh, la plus importante. So yes, I completely agree. Together we can go so much further and it brings so much added value to do things together. And there's also that element of exchange, of learning from one another and seeing what has been done, done elsewhere and how it worked in another region, maybe picking up some ideas and inspiration to apply locally. And this way we can then jointly address the joint challenges that the regions are facing. And it, it really does mean that there is something for everyone. Um, all regions can learn from each other. We can do things together. We can build on our, um, our joint efforts and, and this exchange element is very strongly visible in Interreg Europe, as you very rightly said. I completely agree. Um, we were talking about cohesion policy, we were talking about big challenges and I think a lot of that is reflected also in, in your remarks in this, in this case. Um, uh, we already heard some words of encouragement or maybe expectations for, for future projects and, and future applicants for projects. Um, from your perspective, what are your expectations for cooperation between regions in the 2021-2027 period? 
Alors tout d'abord, bien sûr, j'aimerais que les projets soient plus tangibles, plus concrets. Euh, hier matin, euh, j'ai eu en Corse une réunion avec euh, l'ensemble des acteurs économiques, euh, sociaux, culturels, scientifiques pour travailler euh, sur les prochaines euh, programmations euh, Interreg qui s'ouvrent et Interreg Europe qui s'ouvre aujourd'hui. Euh, il faut du concret, il faut euh, répondre à des questions euh, et aux besoins des populations euh, des projets qui auront un impact direct et réel sur la vie des citoyens, des projets qui seront euh, utiles pour euh, nos territoires. Et pour cela, il faut être d'abord dans l'écoute des besoins de nos populations et des attentes des territoires. À partir de là, il faut s'employer à trouver des villes et des régions partenaires qui ont des attentes similaires afin de travailler ensemble, comme nous l'avons dit euh, il y a un instant. Cela suppose, euh, à mon sens, euh, en amont, un travail de veille et de coordination important pour identifier les problématiques communes et les compétences à croiser. Je ne donnerai euh, qu'un exemple. Euh, en Corse, nous avons travaillé lors de la dernière programmation sur un projet qui s'appelle Invalis, euh, qui concerne la protection de la biodiversité européenne euh, contre les espèces euh, exotiques invasives. Et nous avons travaillé, par exemple, avec la région euh, euh, Lombardie pour protéger euh, la Corse des espèces euh, envahissantes. Euh, nous avons travaillé également avec un projet d'envergure euh, qui implique dix partenaires, le projet Passage, euh, avec euh, des partenaires de toute l'Europe, de la Finlande à la Grèce, en passant par l'Estonie, le Danemark, euh, la Corse, bien sûr, l'Italie. Euh, nous avons travaillé sur... Euh, la question de la pollution euh, dans les zones frontalières où il y a évidemment une importante pression euh, carbone. Donc, euh, il est essentiel d'identifier les acteurs en amont, de répondre à des attentes des territoires. Enfin, j'ai pu relever que les projets que nous mettons en place grâce au programme Interreg sont importants, sont utiles mais par contre, ils ne sont pas toujours visibles, alors qu'il euh, y a une grande valeur ajoutée qui mérite d'être euh, valorisée. Euh, il faut donc communiquer, comme nous y incite d'ailleurs euh, Madame la commissaire Ferreira, communiquer le plus possible sur euh, la politique de coopération, sur la politique de cohésion et enfin, bien sûr, sur tous les apports de l'Union pour le vivre ensemble et le développement économique, social, culturel et la protection de l'environnement. Thank you so much. Again, some very, very concrete and tangible tips right there. Um, maybe just to recap very quickly, so, so making the projects really concrete and tangible is an excellent starting point. Finding that real regional challenge to address and finding the partners who can help with that. And uh, we just heard some very inspiring examples from Corsica and from projects that Corsica is involved in, such as Invalis, for example, or Passage, um, interregional cooperation projects that bring together partners, not only from the region or the nearby area, but really the whole Europe, and, and building on that rich base of experiences and, and finding solutions for issues, whether it is maritime issues or biodiversity or, or, or other such challenges. And I want to pick up what you mentioned about the importance of communication, because it is true that the, that the true value or the results of the project might not always be visible. And it's very important to also, also um, work on the communication side of things and, and show the real added value that comes out of the work that we are doing together. So, so again, some very valuable tips for, for any future project development. I want to thank you very much for, for, for joining us here and sharing your experience and your views. Very much valued. Um, we will now conclude our tour of Europe with different types of comments. And I would just like to thank all of our speakers until now this morning. Thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, um, we have been running a uh, poll on your expectations and your ideas about cohesion. Um, could we maybe bring Slido up on the screen and have a look at what our participants think about cooperation, how they feel about cooperation, how this, how this discussion has been resonating with them? Um, if we could have Slido on the screen, there we go. Uh, inspiring, essential, learning, opportunity, uh, people are excited. Um, 
very good. I see that they're picking up ideas from the discussion and getting ready to hopefully apply some of those in, in future projects and future cooperation. Bring, keep adding those ideas, keep letting us know how that sounds, keep posting in the chat because the call is open, the work is starting, your time to build those projects is here right now. We want to help you to get started and let me just take you through what is going to happen during the rest of the day. So. We have now been talking about um, EU policy and intra Europe in the bigger scheme of cohesion policy, new priorities, 2021-2027 program and how all that works together. We still have one additional keynote speech about the new European Bauhaus, um, trying to get you to think about cooperation a little bit differently, show you what kind of new opportunities and possibilities there are. After that, we're going to take a little break and we're going to start thinking about the call specifically. So I want you to start thinking about the questions you might have. What do you want to know? Um, are you ready for the call? What is it that we can do to help you get ready? What kind of people do you want to meet today? So keep these ideas in mind. Keep thinking about how you fit in this bigger picture of cohesion policy and interregional cooperation. Right now, we will move on to our last speaker of this morning's segment, and that will be Michaela Magas, who is the member of a high-level round table for the new European Bauhaus, and she will tell us about the initiative and how that can spark new type of cooperation. Michaela, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here, and especially at the launch of this new program, which I feel and everybody in the new European Bauhaus team feels is really well aligned with some of the ambitions of the new European Bauhaus. And very much in the spirit of what Commissioner Ferreira has mentioned earlier, no region left behind. I would like to add to that also uh, and to each region according to its needs. And I think I will demonstrate how that might look in practice. Uh, the European Bauhaus was launched in, uh, on the 16th of September 2020. Um, and now for us, this seems like a long time ago because a lot has happened since and the initiative has grown, has really taken hold across the European programs. It has really resonated with people and it is now more important than ever. It's a fantastic tool for cohesion and for cooperation. But for the very first time, the initiative advocated for uniting people across different disciplines and across different cultural and regional backgrounds to work together uh, and to actually create and prototype ideas on the ground. And for the very first time, it, is, uh, it was advocating for feeding policy directly from grassroots experimentation. So what I want to do first is to actually illustrate what that might look like. Uh, I want to bring the human element and the uh, uh, human experience into the story because uh, I have been personally running labs now for uh, uh, 10 years. We have run 20 labs around the world and therefore um, we have a real experience of what it means to create the sort of evidence-based policy that does not just rely on statistics, but on real human transformations and on tangible solutions. Um, this particular example is from Finland. We were invited to launch Slush. This is one of the uh, big events that uh, is uh, really a, a, a point in the calendar uh, of the Helsinki ecosystem. It brings people from all over the world. It's one of the biggest conventions of startups and investors. We're asked to open it by demonstrating new ideas that had been created that week in a lab together with 30 experts uh, from all kinds of backgrounds and areas of expertise. And what we did was that at, at the center of this lab, uh, we placed a uh, wonderful vocal coach from the Sibelius Academy, um, who uh, is a wonderful professional, uh, but also very proud to be a blind singer. And she's called Rika Hanenen. And I just want to uh, tell you about her personal transformation and her personal experience. This is Rika here uh, practicing uh, folk singing uh, 
uh, inspired by the songs of the Finnish traditional Kalevala stories. And the first thing we did was, as a group of uh, people collaborating together and creating new things, was to ask her, what is it you need when you perform? What is it that you are missing, perhaps? And she said, well, interestingly enough, I don't know how the audience feels when I sing. I cannot see them. And so the first thing that happened in the lab was that we actually created a system whereby we were able to in, uh, invite members of the audience to be fitted with pulse sensors so that they could actually communicate directly to the singer and they could convey their emotions directly to the singer so the singer could respond to them. So this was a very simple intervention and technologically it's not a great breakthrough, but it actually created a completely different atmosphere in the room and it created a sense of cohesion and of unity. Uh, but also uh, it enabled uh, some really, really interesting collaborations to happen as a result. Um, some of the things, some of the more uh, frontier technologies that were used where, for example, uh, the neurofeedback team adapted a system uh, that's used in clinical trials for uh, patients uh, who suffer from anxiety attacks. Um, and the system visualizes brain activity so that uh, an onslaught of an attack can be monitored and detected early so that the patient can start to train to control it. But this time, the team adapted the system to play the musical scale directed directly from the brain. And it took two hours for every person in the um, lab to train to play music directly from their brains, uh, which is already quite remarkable. And it's a real experience uh, to go through this. But when Rika, the blind singer, put the neurofeedback sensor on, she was able to play instantly. And all of a sudden, we realized that someone who in the previous, let's say, mechanical era was categorized as less able-bodied than the rest of us because they couldn't see the levers to move, perhaps, was in this new era of brain-computer interfaces far more talented than the rest of us. Now, of course, this has a huge implication on how we think about the future of work, but also how we think about ability and how we include people in, in our collabor collaborative environments. One more example for you, which is very, very different. Of course, in the New European Bauhaus, we really emphasize the um, sustainability and we really work towards uh, the Green New Deal. And in the last two years of the pandemic, our labs have focused on an area which perhaps on this map, which is the most used map in the world, is just indicated as an area of blue. And perhaps it doesn't have particular, it doesn't look like particularly significant. But if we look at it through a satellite image, we can actually see that this area is a rich ecosystem of human dwellings combined with various speech, species. Uh, uh, one of the areas of most uh, greatest biodiversity in Europe, and this is the Ria de Aveiro in Portugal. Now, this area, uh, again here represented really by very much a color blue and not many markers, is uh, one of the most important areas of wetland in Europe and uh, uh, a really wonderful ecosystem, but also under huge threat uh, from the sea levels rise. Um, the city of Aveiro was engulfed by the ocean twice already in its history. But what's really interesting about it is that in the 17th century, after one of those events, um, the same engineers who uh, engineered uh, to stop the waters from coming into the city of Amsterdam were hired by the city of Aveiro to then engineer the canals and let the water uh, in a controlled way into the city of Aveiro. And this is an early example of interregional cooperation around Europe. Now, the reason why we focused on this area during the pandemic is because these wonderful dwellings, which on this open street map are actually uh, drawn in, the communities have drawn themselves in into the water. Um, they literally float on the water. This is 10 centuries of uh, 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 cultivating salt flats in this area that produce this beautiful fleur de sel uh, that has a smell of violets. Um, and these people and these ecosystems 
live in perfect harmony and we can actually learn from them. Um, so we embedded our labs, 50 experts from around the world, including regional experts, to work in this area and to come up jointly with ideas and to research and to come up with projects in just one week. These weeks of collaborative energy and injection um, uh, are really uh, acupuncture points for both personal and project development, but also serve to generate really important ideas and solutions that we can then scale. So the enthusiasm and the energy that these uh, uh, real tangible prototyping events bring to the table, you can see here with people literally uh, measuring um, and immersing themselves into the environment, but also uh, completely uh, agnostic to backgrounds, to age, they're entirely transgenerational. Here we have, for example, a wonderful uh, oceanographer, a lady who's got huge reputation, uh, uh, long-standing um, experience, who was actually coming in uh, from uh, various different locations. We had experts coming in, focusing on this area, and also eight uh, different global uh, satellites that joined for the whole week to focus on this wonderful region and on what can be done with it. These were satellites from across the Americas and also across Europe. So four across the Americas and four across Europe uh, that all participated. And then uh, a series of uh, different projects, 13 different projects as a result of just one week of activity that combined both frontier technologies, all kinds of uh, uh, technologies, including neural networks, artificial intelligence, all kinds of sensors, but also very importantly, indigenous technologies, crafts, local knowledge, and also uh, reuse of local materials, circularity, a uh, huge variety of different, very, very very interesting uh, solutions. And uh, in the picture, you see a Harvard fellow who joined us uh, for, for this purpose. Now, uh, this is just to illustrate what can be done. These are things that create tangible results, which we can then scale. And what is really remarkable that this wonderful group of people that I have great privilege to work with have actually realized just how important it is to create these real tangible prototypes on the ground where we can infer best practice and we can then scale them directly to policy. And I'm very, very glad that I'm able to be part of this process. Also part of this process are over 400 incredible partners who have been really very much part of the co-creation process from the start. They were selected because they were active and because they were actively contributing. Now, we have a call out in a few days for Friends of NEB, which will actually address regional governments to come and join us and to contribute. Every voice across Europe needs to be heard. This is something that we are very, very keen on in, in the new European Bauhaus. We have had thousands, literally thousands of ideas from across Europe submitted based on the three pillars of the new European Bauhaus, which are sustainability, inclusion, and aesthetics. Incredible ideas, uh, all of which require uh, uh, attention, and they have been feeding again uh, policy missions. Um, we had we ran our first uh, conference last year. Um, we had eight thousand participants at this conference. So this was really remarkable how much this uh, uh, mission has resonated with communities on the ground. And you can see from the language used here: uh, collaboration, uh, living labs, co-designing a movement. It is truly become, it has truly become a movement. Now, this year we are running the NEB Festival. It will be between the 9th and the 12th of um, uh, June um, it, uh, with a center in Brussels, but with lots of satellites across different regions. Loads of uh, suggestions for satellite events have been uh, sent in. Uh, this is a truly uh, open collaborative space. I hope that you will, you will join us. Um, and uh, prizes, uh, this, this is a um, gallery of prizes uh, from last year, but this year we ensured that every single region in Europe gets prizes. So watch out for the announcements uh, because uh, 
applications have been received right across the European regions. So we are really happy to support excellent projects on the ground. Um, and as I mentioned already, I am very privileged to be part of the High Level Roundtable, be working with these exceptional people who include, amongst others, also our colleagues Shigeru Ban, uh, who is currently providing shelters for our uh, uh, refugees from, from, from U uh, the Ukraine, and uh, uh, Sheila uh, Patel, who's uh, uh, someone who has made uh, a real uh, uh, important missions with the women's collectives in India. So they give us a beyond European perspective, which is also very important for us to understand how do we create a roadmap for Europe. Um, when it comes to some of these grand missions that we take on, uh, we also believe that some of these methods are really uh, uh, important for integrating incoming talent into Europe and channeling them towards our joint missions. So this is for this reason, when we started our co-creation process in the Euro European Bauhaus, the first thing we did was to map our fund foundational values. And the first thing that emerged was a very strong line of justice as the first thing that we, um, we really observed and that we based our concept paper on. And in our concept paper, which I do encourage you to read, is available online. The regions are mentioned throughout the entire high-level roundtable was uh, really, really uh, keen to include uh, all of the European regions in, in this movement. And we really want to hear every single voice across Europe. Now, uh, using this method of interdisciplinary thinking and collaborative uh, labs, but also experimental learning labs. So there's a call out right now about places of learning and about new ideas about how we can learn together. But uh, one thing that I am particularly pleased to uh, to see is that uh, the Interreg Europe program, the um, Committee of the Regions, and Commissioner Ferreira's uh, cohesion funds um, have all aligned uh, for the very first time to see how we can jointly scale ideas from the ground up. And there is currently a proposal on the table that has been included in the next uh, Committee of the Regions statement for 100 labs across 100 European regions that would create a regional recovery spark at this time when we really need it to have this huge injection of energy on the ground that, that where the, we could then scale the best ideas and channel them towards bigger funding uh, so that we create a fantastic multiplier effect. So on that note, I would like to focus back on the great minds, on the hugely diverse communities on the ground, each region according to its needs. And according to our experience, we can definitely say that the future of work is driven by missions. And in e if each one of these people who are part of this process um, are able to take one step forward in their personal development as a result of this process, we will have a phenomenal societal transformation. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to the rest of the forum. Thank, thank you so much. There was a lot of content there. I'm not even sure where to begin, but I, I like how you showed that um, there is indeed cooperation beyond Interreg Europe as well, but we all uh, address these joint challenges together and it's also together that we find those solutions. Um, I also liked the example of going from very specific initiatives that are then scalable and can be can be moved and can be expanded further because that's also very much what, what happens in our projects as well. Um, a very quick comment, we're almost done with this session, but maybe just to add, because we've been asking the other speakers this morning as well about the, the final calls or the, or the wishes for our participants. So uh, what would you... Um, recommend or, or encourage our participants today to do right after hearing this, this opening session? One thing that uh, I would definitely recommend is that uh, the participants join us in NEB, in the New European Bauhaus, uh, and contribute their ideas. Um, we have 
uh, lots of co cooperation with Interreg Europe. Uh, there are several different new mechanisms that are being currently designed. So if we can hear your ideas and if we can uh, understand what your needs are, perhaps we can better direct some of the new calls or some of the new uh, instruments that are being designed to help you scale your ideas from the ground up. All right, thank you. Uh, that brings us to the close of this session with all of our speakers. Thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you for sharing your tips. Thank you for sharing your inspiration. Um, I also want to hear more of those voices. We just heard that when you don't see the participants, you don't know how they are feeling. So at the moment, since we are in an online event, um, we are reading your pulse through the chat and through the Slido pulse, which have been very, very active. So thank you so far for, for being so active. Keep it up during the rest of the event. Um, as said, we will now move to talking about the first call for project proposals. Before that, we will take a little break and a couple of things for you to do during the break. First of all, there is a poll open. We want to know what you want to know about the first call. We'll start answering these questions and uh, addressing those topics right after the break. There is also a networking tab on Slido. Why don't you, on Slido, on Hopin, sorry. On the left side of Hopin screen, you will see a networking section. Go there within the next 15 minutes or so, meet up with one of the other participants, put a face to that name on the participants list and see if you have something in common, maybe something to build on to start new cooperation. Um, we're going to take a little break, but leading into the break, I want to leave you with a few more voices, those from our lead partners from current running Interreg Europe projects who will share their views of cooperation. Share yours in the networking area, share yours in the chat and see you back at 11.15. It's about uh, taking part in building the cohesion of our communities. It can bring uh, and it can provide a complete learning journey to respond to challenges addressed by European regions. There are many benefits of this kind of cooperation uh, in Interreg Europe project. Uh, the first one is gaining new experiences, new knowledge. And from the exchange, really, you have an enrichment of your knowledge or your capacity to, to, to act, to apply for your activities. Uh, and of course, you get also very practical ideas by, by looking at, at other examples and talking with other people about it. This could be very inspiring for, for improving the regional uh, policy instruments, for improving the, the local practices, for trans, transferring some practices from elsewhere into the region. This is the opportunity uh, not only to learn, but also to bring what you have learned to your region and improve uh, your regional policies. It's more about working together and what that brings about. And those benefits are very big. So that's, it's not only about the topic or subject of the project, it's about making contact. Be entrepreneurial in the way you think how to set up the partnership. Uh, take the risk to explore new new project ideas, new topics, and uh, and very um, unconventional partnerships. Uh, very diverse regions bring them together into the into the consortium. It starts to work quickly because the time is uh, strict. The the work to do is uh, quite long and approaching and involving partners is not a quick uh, a quick work to do is very uh, it's very demanding so it's uh, enjoy of the of the information enjoy but by the way start to involve people in your project take the risk of uh of being innovative and being non-conventional in your approach from common needs, we can find joint solutions and it is like that.